to say chimes perfectly with the presentation you've given. Um, I've had the privilege of being the Member of Parliament for Denton and Reddish for 14 years now. Uh, and being the MP for a constituency like Denton and Reddish, you learn very quickly that identity matters. Mm -hmm. It's a cross-borough constituency, so you've got the dynamics of representing a part of Tameside and a part of Stockport. Um, and those identities matter. Um, if you live in Denton, you are proudly uh, a Dentonian. And if you live in Reddish, you are proudly a Stockfordian. Um, and you learn very quickly about that pride. Uh, representing a part of Tameside, you very quickly realise how parochial the place is. It was only created in 1974 with the bits of Greater Manchester that were left over uh, and bolted together. Nine fiercely independent communities um, and representing three of them, uh, Audenshaw, Denton and Duckinfield, you learn very quickly that in Audenshaw you are Audenshaw's Member of Parliament, not the MP for Denton and Reddish, and likewise in Duckinfield you are Duckinfield's Member of Parliament, you're not the MP for Denton and Reddish. Um, and the constituency name creates a problem, because for half of the constituency they are neither Denton nor Reddish, they are Audenshaw, Duckinfield, uh, Horton Green, Heaton Chapel, and where we are here Heaton Norris and they are very proud of uh, those identities. To complicate identity even further, um, for 800 years Audenshaw, Denton and Reddish and the Heatons was in Lancashire. Yes, even this bit of Stockport north of the Mersey and to the west of the Tame was in the historic county of Lancashire. Uh, Reddish and Heatons left Lancashire in 1906 when it became part of the County Borough of Stockport and by virtue of becoming part of the County Borough of Stockport was moved into ceremonial Cheshire. Um, Duckinfield remained in Cheshire uh, until 1974 uh, but throughout its history uh, Denton and Audenshaw remained in Lancashire until 1974 uh, and uh, then, since 1974, in different boroughs, the whole of my constituency has been in Greater Manchester. So talk about an identity crisis, <laughs> and that's before we get on to England and Britain. Um, but identity really does matter. Um, and it doesn't have to be exclusive. You can be more than one identity, and I think that's the important message, that uh, you you can't be more British than English, you are actually both, but you can be proud of one as equally as the other. You can be proud of one more than the other. Um, and uh, that's something that perhaps the Labour Party and the Labour movement has lost in recent years. It wasn't always that way. And as a reminder as to why it wasn't always that way, every year at annual conference, it really grates on the Scots and the Welsh, but we don't just sing the red flag, we sing Jerusalem. Jerusalem is an England only song of social democracy, of social justice. It's a song that I'm very proud of because it talks about the dark satanic mills. So it has real resonance to uh, this part of the world and the fight, as John said, for democracy, whether it is um, through the Peterloo uh, battle or the, um, the suffragette movement. Uh, this part of the world has been always at the forefront of those battles for, for social justice, for democracy and for representation, something that we should be absolutely proud of. Um, but as those old certainties, as John put them, uh, of solidarity, the, the social glue uh, through industrialisation and that sense of community because you all worked in the mill or all worked in the mines or all worked uh, in whatever the industry of that particular town has moved on as globalisation has taken control we actually feel lost not just in our local identity but in our national identity too and so it is really important that as a party and as a movement we start to speak to those lost identities and that's why talking about England really matters. Now as John's reminded me 
uh, and he does on umpteen occasions, I shadow an England only department. And so I have very quickly learned to mm. follow John's lead and I always reference the fact that I speak for local government in England. Uh, there is a Welsh Labour minister in government who speaks for local government in Wales. There's an SNP minister in Holyrood that speaks for local government in Scotland. And Labour's local government voice for England and England only. Uh, when we talk about communities, I talk for the communities, speak for the communities in England only. And they are very diverse communities that we speak for. Um, but again, it's that sense of identity. You can uh, be, uh, I hate the term, but white working class and be English and be proud. You can be from an Asian community and be English and be proud. You can be from an Afro-Caribbean community and be English and be proud because Englishness is not whiteness. Uh, Englishness and that sense of Englishness is, I think, a set of values. It's what we believe in. It's who we are. It's about fairness. It's about social justice. It's about community. It's about looking after one another. It's about that sense of place. And it doesn't matter what your race, what your religion, what your social background is, we can all share those values. And actually what we see from the 2017 general election is that when there is a coming together of those values and our policies, and often the communities we, we seek to represent, who feel that politics as a whole has left them isolated, that nobody speaks to them or for them, when you go down to the policy level and you talk about the nationalisation of water or the other utilities, when you talk about the National Health Service, when you talk about public services, when you talk about crime and disorder and getting more police on the, on the street, they actually are on our side. They share our ambitions for the country. And so if there's that disconnect with identifying with Labour's policies, there's a tick, but identifying with the Labour Party as somebody who speaks up for them and their identity, and there isn't a tick in that box, there's a task of work to do for precisely the reason that John set out, because we cannot win an election without winning those communities and the people that live in those communities. And so with my other hat on as Labour's national campaign coordinator, we've been doing a lot of work to find out how we can start to communicate better with those groups that are aligned with our values, are aligned with our policies, but in 2017 couldn't make the <coughs> final jump across to the Labour column to vote for us. And it cost us seats across Lancashire, across uh, West Yorkshire, seats that we have to win, like Pendle, uh, like Morley and Outwood, um, if we are to form a government. So there is a task uh, there. The last thing I want to talk about is once we get that Labour government and we've got that programme of radicalism, we've got to think about how we can deliver that in the best long-term way. And I think that that means uh, devolving power and responsibility down to local communities. And uh, this is actually a process that was started by John Denham. Uh, the Greater Manchester Combined Authority Order, although George Osborne likes to take the credit for the devolution to Greater Manchester, the order was actually signed by Labour's last Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government in 2009. It's just that we then left office and George Osborne took the credit for the work that John had started. So that process of devolution had already begun by that Labour government. But look, we've got a patchwork quilt across England. Scotland has got a very clearly defined devolution package and Wales too. Northern Ireland, when they get their act together, will they have an assembly, they have a, an executive, 
But across England, you've got a mismatch. You've got parts of England that have two-tier local government. In some areas, it's three-tier because they have parish councils as well as districts and county councils. In other parts of England, you've got unitary local government. Uh, in the metropolitan areas, you've got a mismatch. So places like Greater Manchester, you've got a mayor, a combined authority, metropolitan districts. But our mayor and combined authority has greater powers than, for example, uh, South Yorkshire. Uh, where they've got a combined authority and a mayor and the mayor pretty much is the chair of the transport authority the, the uh, level of powers that has been devolved in south yorkshire is probably the minimum level of powers that any combined authority's got greater manchester is currently the maximum um, but this mismatch <coughs> doesn't work because actually when you look at our manifesto offer and the next manifesto is going to be even more radical. We're talking about regional investment banks. We're talking about regional infrastructure boards. We're talking about m many billions of pounds being devolved uh, out of London to local decision makers to make the decisions on big ticket items, on industrial growth, on the green industrial revolution, on transport infrastructure across regions, not just within regions. And to be able to do that fairly, and to be able to do that democratically, we have to have the structures in place that actually people feel they've got a sense of buy-in to. And I think one of the lessons of the last Labour government is you cannot impose regional government, even on regions that all the polling shows are in favour of regional government, um, because they don't necessarily want another tier of politicians, they don't necessarily want um, more bureaucracy. Um, so that is one of the challenges that my team is looking at. How can we devolve real power, real resource and uh, real meaningful change to the parts of England that are crying out for that change and are only too happy to point to the benefits that Scotland have from devolution and the benefits that Wales have from devolution and the unfairness of the Barnet formula. You really wouldn't believe it John but when knocking on doors in 2015 when uh, the, um, the image of Ed Miliband in the pocket of yeah. Alex Salmond really resonated. I was knocking on uh, the um, doors of the uh, Ambleside Road Estate, Council Estate in South Reddish, where issues of like the Barnet formula wouldn't normally come up on the doorstep. <laughs> but in that election, it did. It was seen as an unfairness between Scotland and England and the Scots call all the shots and how can that be right? And it was at that moment, it was a it, it was a St Paul on the road to Damascus moment for me. I realised that probably we had lost the 2015 general election because we, had, we were seen to be being pro everywhere except our own area. Uh, and uh, that, was, uh, that manifested itself in us being seen to be too pro Scotland as a party that wanted to govern the whole of the United Kingdom. Now, we've still got those challenges because we want to win seats back in Scotland. But the way you win seats back in Scotland is to be honest and to say Scotland's place in the Union matters for a whole range of reasons. But those reasons aren't uh, for the English uh, water industry to be nationalised by a Labour government. The reasons for Scotland to be in the Union are because of uh, that social um, pact that if we are going to uh, combat poverty, I'm just as outraged about poverty in Motherwell as I am in Manchester. Um, but the way to tackle poverty in Motherwell is through the Scottish Parliament. We devolve responsibility to Scotland and we get a Labour fight back for Holyrood and a Labour fight back from that uh, to win us seats for Westminster so that those things that we want to do internationally 
uh, as socialists and across the whole of the United <coughs> Kingdom as socialists, we can make that case for. But the case for England can only be made in England. And I'm very receptive to the idea of um, ensuring that England only policies are communicated as England only policies, uh, whether that is as an English manifesto or just by stating the fact that it is the English railways that we're talking about, it is English local government we're talking about, it is the English National Health Service that we're talking about, it is the English Education Service that we're talking about when we're talking about transforming our public services because in Scotland, Wales and in Northern Ireland their own assemblies, their own parliaments, their own executives deal with those matters on behalf of the people uh, of those countries. England is a country of 55 million people. We've got to be the voice of radicalism in England because if we're not the voice of radicalism in England, if we're not the progressive voice for England, then we cede English identity, we cede Englishness to those whose values we don't share, whose values we abhor. We cede it to the far right, to the extremists, and that's not the country I want to live in. I'm proud to be British, I'm proud to be European, I am proud to be English, I am proud to be Mancunian, I'm proud to be Dentonian, I'm proud to be a Tamesider, I'm proud to be from historic Lancashire. <laughs> I've got an identity crisis. <laughs> but you know what? I'm proud to be Labour. I want a Labour government. I want to transform the whole of the United Kingdom. And the only way we can do that is by winning England. Thank you very much.